Hi, this is Mark Gamienkowski. I'm speaking to you from Johns Hopkins University, um, and I'm going to here. I'm going to here to tell you about parity violation in the cosmic microwave background and elsewhere in cosmology and astrophysics. And I thought I'd start with a slide that shows Chern Simons. Sorry, two mathematicians, Chern and Simons, were responsible for some of the mathematics that inspires and underlies. Um, parity breaking for the motivations for parity breaking in physics and in mathematics. I've got a picture of the cosmic microwave background. I'll talk about parity breaking signatures or parity violation signatures in the cosmic microwave background. A little bit about gravitational wave astrophysics as well. So I thought I'd start by telling you how my interest in this got started. I was an assistant professor at Columbia University in the 1990s and um, I was in the particle theory group that was led by T.D. Lee, and T.D. Lee um, was one of the two people who got the Nobel Prize for suggesting the notion that parity might be broken in fundamental physics. And um, <clears throat> that notion uh, was then verified within about two weeks by Chen Cheng Wu, who's an experimentalist at Columbia University. Um, she did not share in the Nobel Prize for the discovery of parity violation, which I think she should have, but she did get her name on a postage stamp. And she was a pretty remarkable scientist, uh, well beyond um, the work that she's perhaps best known for. So anyway, parity breaking was in the air. I was, in a, cosmo I was a cosmologist, and so I started to think about um, parity in cosmology. So of course, um, as um, Li and Yang postulated and Chen Cheng Wu and actually a few others almost simultaneously um, discovered um, fundamental interactions are parity breaking. And in particular, um, the physics of neutrinos is parity breaking. And in fact, in the standard model, it's only a neutrino that has a left-handed helicity that interacts with other standard model particles. A right-handed neutrino, a neutrino with the right-handed helicity does not interact. Um, parity is one of the three discrete symmetries in quantum field theory. Another one is charge conjugation, C. Um, one of the things that's interesting about parity breaking in the standard model, or at least for the neutrinos, is that although right-handed neutrinos do not interact, um, if I do a parity inversion and then a charge conjugation, I replace that right-handed neutrino with the right-handed anti-neutrino, that in fact does interact in the standard model. So although there is a disparity between left and right-handed neutrinos in the standard model, there's still some notion of symmetry between particle and antiparticle as long as we replace the um, parities of those particles, the antiparticles. Um, as far as I know, the idea of discrete um, symmetries in cosmology was introduced by Andrei Sakharov. Um, so shortly after parity breaking was discovered, it wasn't too much longer, that um, Cronin and Fitch and their collaborators discovered that CP was also violated, that in fact there is a very subtle difference between the behavior of particles and antiparticles. Um, and in particular, given the CPT theorem, which says that CPT is um, conserved, the products of charge parity, charge parity and time reversal invariance are conserved in relativistic quantum field theories, um, that involves that there is some time reversal, breaking of time reversal invariance. So particles and antiparticles can actually interact at slightly different um, rates if there is violation of CP. And now Andrei Sakharov realized that, that might be related to the imbalance between matter and antimatter in the universe. And he came up with these ideas about um, the re ingredients required for an initially baryon symmetric universe to become baryon asymmetric as our universe is. Um, so it turns out that fundamental physics is not only is not the only thing that breaks parity. Biology is parity breaking. DNA molecules have a specific candidness. Lots of other organic molecules have specific candidnesses. Um, people are parity breaking. Um, if you look at yourself in a mirror, you do not see the same thing that other people see. Um, we are not symmetric under a left-right inversion. And I think the reason that this is interesting from the point of view of cosmology, well, not necessarily the biological parity breaking, the reason why um, breaking of parity in fundamental interactions is interesting in cosmology 
is that we have this notion in cosmology that there's a lot of new physics that is required to explain the large scale features of the universe. So we have a standard model of particle physics in which weak and electromagnetic interactions are unified into an SU2 cross U1 gauge theory. There are ideas that that electroweak interaction is unified with the strong interactions, the SU3, um, in some higher energy theory, a grand unified theory. And there are also notions that um, the three interactions, the weak electromagnetic and strong interactions are then unified with gravity um, in some quantum gravity or string theory. Now, the reason why this is interesting for cosmology is that there are many aspects of the universe that we do not understand and cannot be understood within the context of the standard model physics that we know about. So in particular, inflation, generation of primordial perturbations and smoothing of the primordial universe requires some type of new physics. Um, baryogenesis requires some type of new physics. Dark matter requires new physics. Dark energy requires new physics. Uh, perhaps a resolution to the Hubble tension requires new physics. And if we believe in unification, and if we believe that all of these issues of cosmology are described by um, new physics, then it's reasonable to ask if there are manifestations of parity breaking in the electroweak interactions, maybe there are manifestations of parity breaking in the physics that gives rise to some of these observed features of the universe. So that's the motivation. Um, so the energy scales involved with electroweak interactions are about 100 GeV, a TeV for, um, you know, well, 100 GeV, TeV. Um, the quantum gravity scale is expected to be um, much higher. So here's the question. When we look at the universe, when we do observation, cosmological observations, are those cosmological observations consistent with parity um, symmetry? So as I said, here are some of the reasons why we need new physics, primordial density perturbations, dark energy, early dark energy, dark matter, baryogenesis. And then there's also neutrino physics. Um, there is new physics in the neutrino sector. Neutrino masses and mixings are not accommodated within the standard model. And so perhaps there's something um, going on there as well. So the idea that my collaborators, um, Arthur Liu, Lehman Wong, and I had, um, in 1999 was to look for parity breaking in the cosmic microwave background. So in the cosmic microwave background, we have temperature fluctuations, but we also have polarization. And a polarization field on the surface of the sky can be mapped into two different um, geometrically distinguishable modes, the E modes and the B modes. Um, the E modes and the B modes have opposite parity. E modes, and I'll show you a picture of this, um, are parity invariant, whereas B modes change sign under a parity inversion. And so what we suggested is that you could measure an EB cross correlation from maps of the cosmic microwave background polarization. And if you were to find such a um, correlation that was non-zero, that would be a signature of parity breaking. So here is the picture. So here's sort of a cartoon picture of a polarization pattern for um, an E mode. So each of these lines represents the orientation of a polarization at some point in the sky. And so if I had this, you know, um, hedgehog type configuration and I were to look at it in a mirror, it would look exactly the same. But here is another possible um, configuration of polarizations on a two dimensional surface. And here, if I were to look at this in a mirror, it would look different. It would be the same thing, but with the opposite sign. So B mode switch signs under a parity inversion, an E mode does not. And so if I see a cross correlation between an E mode and a B mode, the parity inversion would have the opposite sign. And so an E B cross correlation is a sign of parity breaking. Now, it turns out that there are ideas there were already ideas, um, even when we wrote this paper, about new physics that could give rise to such parity breaking um, observ um, observational signatures. 
So one obvious thing to try is a quintessence field. So in the late 1990s, um, supernova evidence for an accelerated expansion had just come out and people start to think about what the cosmological constant might actually be. Um, some people were unhappy with the notion of a non-zero cosmological constant. And so they came up with an idea called quintessence in which there's a scalar field that um, rolls slowly down its potential. And as it does so, it can mimic the behavior of a cosmological constant, but ultimately in the distant future, um, in the vacuum state, there is no cosmological constant. But this idea involves the introduction of a scalar field phi that evolves with time. Now, Harari and Sakivi had pointed out in 1992, and Carol Field and Shakif had pointed out in 1998, and then Sean Carroll had written another paper on, at about the same time called Quintessence in the Rest of the World. So it turns out that if you have a scalar field, um, an obvious that has a low mass, it has to have a very low mass to roll very, very slowly, um, an obvious guess is that it is an axion-like field that couples to electromagnetism through this FF dual. So the Lagrangian for standard electromagnetism is one quarter F squared, where F is the field strength tensor. But you can also add a term in which F is multiplied by its dual, F tilde. And um, this term over here, FF dual, can be written as a total derivative and therefore has no dynamical consequences. However, if it's multiplied by a scalar field phi that's evolving in time, then it can have consequences. Now this term FF dual is parity breaking. So in terms of the electric and magnetic fields, F squared is E squared minus B squared, but FF dual is E dot B, where E is the electric field and B is the magnetic field. And so FF dual um, changes sign under parity inversion, whereas F squared does not. So if I have this term, and if it has dynamical consequences, it is parity breaking. It is also time reversal breaking. It breaks P and it breaks T. And if I have a scalar field phi that is evolving in time, then time reversal is explicitly broken. And the equations of motion then show that that explicit time reversal breaking is manifest as parity breaking um, in the propagation of photons. And in particular, you can derive the Maxwell's equations, the modifications to Maxwell's equations that arise when you add this term to the Lagrangian. And what you find is that right and left circularly polarized electromagnetic waves in the presence of a time evolving phi propagate with slightly different velocities. And what that means is that if I have a linearly polarized electromagnetic wave, that linearly polarized electromagnetic wave gets rotated by some angle alpha I don't have it written down here, but that angle alpha is the change in phi divided by this m star. Um, so the linear polarization of electromagnetic waves gets rotated um, as the electromagnetic wave propagates. So in particular, um, if I have a polarization pattern that is a pure E mode, and I rotate each one of these slightly, say, to the right, then I will introduce some small B mode. And that B mode will then be correlated with the E mode that it comes from. And that gives rise to a non-zero EB cross correlation. And over the years, um, you know, CMB experimentalists and people who analyze CMB data have been looking for this. Um, and as of, you know, a decade ago, the upper limits were that alpha was less than a few degrees. Um, Here's sort of a picture of the introduction of a parity of breaking EB correlation. So if I have a primordial map that's this um, purple map, um, and I have cosmolog cosmic birefringence, then the angle of each one of these is going to be rotated by the same amount alpha. And then the rotated map is going to have some B mode that's correlated with the E mode. Um, there are also parity breaking TB correlations. So the temperature is invariant under a parity transformation, parity inversion. And so if I have a TB cross correlation, that's also a signature of parity breaking in addition to an EB cross correlation. And that has also been sought. And um, I'm not going to talk about it in detail. Hopefully, someone else will be discussing this in this conference. Um, there has been evidence um, 
from Planck that has appeared the past few years for a non-zero cosmic birefringence rotation. Um, so we will hear talks about this, I hope. Um, the analyses are complicated, but they're done very carefully. Um, there might be pitfalls, but um, the current result is that this rotation angle, which here they call beta, the cosmic birefringence rotation angle, um, is discrepant from zero or departs from zero at about three sigma, roughly speaking, the three sigma level. So if this is the case, we've discovered parity breaking in cosmology. Um, I just wanted to advertise some recent work. So when we do this measurement, um, we are of the EB and TB cross correlations, we are actually looking for a change in the um, value of phi at the surface of last scatter and today. We're looking for rotation that takes place somewhere between the surface of last scatter and redshift 1100 until today. But it could be that in some models, um, the rotation all takes place at late times, or in some models it might be that all the rotation takes place at early times. And um, I wrote a paper recently with Salim Hotinli, Gil Holder, Matt Johnson. And what we pointed out in this paper, and uh, the vast majority of the work was done by Salim, um, in the near future, we are going to be detecting something called a kinetic or kinematic polarized sonyayev zeldovich effect. So um, here, what we have are photons that scatter from the free electrons in galaxy clusters or in the intergalactic medium more generally. And scattering of those photons by free electrons in the intergalactic medium gives rise to polarized, polarization. The scattered light is polarized. Um, and it may be possible with um, the kinematic or kinetic polarized SC effect to actually detect this polarization as a function of redshift and actually do a similar EB analysis on these KSC maps. And in this way, actually measure the cosmic birefringence rotation angle as a function of redshift. So this is a plot from that paper. Um, it's a fairly weak signal. This is the primary EE power spectrum. This is the primary, um, this is the lensed BB power spectrum, the BB power spectrum induced by gravitational lensing. But here are the contributions from the polarized um, kinematic um, scenario of Saldovich effect. And what's interesting is in the absence of primordial B modes, this um, scattered radiation is pure E mode. And if you detect a B mode that's cross correlated with that E mode, that indicates cosmic birefringence. Um, so anyway, um, the signal is fairly weak, but you can cross correlate with galaxy surveys. That's the whole point of KSC tomography. And so it can actually conceivably be detected with next generation experiments. Now, um, in this paper we wrote in 1999, we noticed, an, uh, we pointed out another possibility for parity breaking that could give rise to EB and TB cross correlations. And that is a churn simons coupling of a um, scalar field phi to the um, churn simons term for gravity. So here R is the Riemann tensor and R dual is the dual Riemann tensor. So in gravity, the Lagrangian is just R, the Ricci scalar. <clears throat> However, there are alternative gravity theories, including some that arise as a consequence of string theory, in which that um, Einstein-Hilbert action gets modified through the addition of some R, R dual term, where R, R dual is coupled to some scalar field phi, which may in some situations be a dilaton field, but may also be some other field. So what we postulated <clears throat> or pointed out in this paper is that if phi is the inflaton, then again, during inflation, phi is time evolving. R, R dual are pair, is parity breaking and time reversal invariant. It's the explicit breaking of time reversal invariance associated with the rolling of the scalar field then translates into parity breaking in the dynamics of the gravitational field. <laughs> and in particular, what we showed is that this leads to something which is now referred to as amplitude by refringence, where the right and left circular polarized gravitational waves wind up having a different amplitude. So if we have this term in the Lagrangian and if phi double dot is non-zero, so it turns out that you have to have a non-zero second derivative of phi, 
if phi double dot is non-zero, <clears throat> then the, ampl um, the amplitude of right-handed gravitational waves is amplified while the left-handed are um, suppressed or vice versa, depending on the sign of phi double dot. And again, um, if you have primordial gravitational waves, those affect the polarization pattern of the cosmic microwave background. Um, and we showed that they actually give rise, that this term then gives rise to a non-vanishing EB and TB cross-correlation. And what this plot is intended to show is that um, in principle, you could distinguish a parity breaking signal from cosmic birefringence from one from chiral gravitational waves through the L dependence of <clears throat> the TB and EB cross correlations. So the blue lines here, blue curves show the um, TB and EB cross correlations if you have um, cosmic birefringence and the red show what you have if you have uh, chiral gravitational waves. So more, pro more power on large scales for chiral gravitational waves, more power on small scales for cosmic birefringence. <clears throat> now it may be that the scalar field phi has spatial fluctuations. If it varies in time, it can also vary in space. And so it's conceivable that the rotation angle might vary from one point on the sky to another. And so I wrote a paper in 2008, and then another paper with Vera Glustovich and Asanta Kure the year after, and Gadav et al. wrote a similar paper in 2009, where we pointed out that um, you can use higher order correlations in the temperature and polarization map of the cosmic microwave background, techniques analogous to those used for weak lensing reconstruction to measure the rotation as a function of angle uh, or position on the sky. And in this way, you could not only um, reconstruct the polarization pattern, um, sorry, reconstruct the rotation angle, you could also um, reconstruct the primordial polarization pattern if that primordial polarization pattern was, um, was um, altered by late time spatially varying cosmic birefringence. So, <clears throat> You know, here's a picture, a cartoon picture. So suppose I had some primordial pattern. It was this purple pattern over here. And then suppose that the rotation, it was a rotation for cosmic birefringence, but the rotation angle was different everywhere in the sky. Then you'd have a rotated polarization map, an observed polarization map that had nothing to do with the primordial polarization map. So it turns out that it's kind of, um, if you first hear about it, it seems like magic because what I'm telling you is that we have um, observables, which are the Stokes parameters Q and U at every point in the sky. And from those two observables, I'm telling you that I can tell you the rotation angle alpha at every point in the sky, as well as the primordial Q and the primordial U at the, at, um, the surface of last scatter. So it seems that I'm able to extract three different numbers from two observed numbers. Um, and it turns out that it's not magic. It's actually, um, it's, a, it's sort of a manifestation of a maximum likelihood technique that you do under the assumption that the primordial polarization pattern is Gaussian. Um, and it's analogous to thing, to te techniques that people use to reconstruct um, weak lensing um, and de-lens the cosmic microwave background. Um, it's also analogous to techniques that people use to try to infer um, the optical depth or um, fluctuations in the optical depth. Um, there's another possibility for cosmic birefringence, and that is um, with radio sources. So suppose that um, there's cosmic birefringence, electromagnetic waves, the polarization pattern for electromagnetic waves are being modified as they propagate from the surface of last scatter to us. Um, then other sources at cosmological distances, like um, bright radio galaxies, should also experience cosmic birefringence. So there are radio galaxies that are have um, very large, bright radio lobes, presumably powered by a supermassive black um, um, outflow from a supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy. Um, these radio lobes could be quite large, extend almost as large as a megaparsec. Um, and it turns out that they are also polarized. Um, so if you see um, a source that is bright and has an obvious elongation 
and it has some polarization angle, uh, like this red over here, on average, at least, certainly for one source, I mean, these are complicated sources, you don't expect the polarization to be perfectly perpendicular to the elongation of the source. But on average, if you have a huge number of such sources, you would expect um, the elongation to be perpendicular to the polarization on average. So it turns out that you can look for these types of alignments um, in roughly several hundred sources. And I did a simple analysis and I found that the rotation angle uh, for a uniform cosmic birefringence was less than a few degrees. Um, and you can do the same thing for spatially varying rotation. Um, if you have a rotation angle that varies as a function of position of the sky, um, <clears throat> then you can um, expand it in terms of spherical harmonics and you can, you can uh, measure the spherical harmonic coefficients by convolving the apparent um, angle between the elongation and the polarization, linear polarization, um, over the entire sky. Um, so again, I did a simple analysis, and what I found is that um, these spherical harmonic coefficients for an angle, uh, a position, or a, a uh, position-dependent cosmic birefringence angle could be um, constrained to be less than about four degrees for about 10 sources of greater, perhaps just greater than two. Um, I never followed through with this, but I think it might still be interesting to try to do so. In principle, you could do better with um, high-resolution um, images of individual radio sources. So here's a picture of one of these bright radio sources. And um, you see that these radio lobes have a lot of structure, which is um, in terms of intensity. So the very, there's a very bright spot over here, a slightly less bright spot over here, but there is structure in the intensity. And they can also measure in some of these sources, the linear polarization pattern. And again, you can imagine doing a, um, you know, deep, decomposing the intensity and polarization map into um, Fourier modes and E and B modes. And again, looking for an EB or intensity B cross correlation. So in principle, you should be able to measure the EB cross correlation any given map um, and also the intensity B mode cross correlation any given map and measure um, rotation angle or infer um, a rotation angle to the source. Now, of course, these are complicated sources. So any given source looks expected to have a non-vanishing value of alpha. But if you take a bunch of sources spread throughout the sky, on average, the alpha that you infer from all these different sources should be on average zero, unless there's cosmic birefringence. So there are other ways to look for parity breaking in the cosmic microwave background. Um, the EB and TB cross correlations that I've discussed so far are two point correlations, um, but there are also higher order correlations that you can seek. Um, or put another way, there are more general two point correlation functions that, are, that violate statistical isotropy, um, violate the assumption of statistical isotropy that you can check. So this is work that I did with Laura Book and Tarun Suradit um, on i pair t bipolar spherical harmonics. So if we measure the spherical harmonic coefficients ALM for the temperature or polarization at the surface of last scatter, inflation predicts, or statistical isotropy predicts, that there should be no correlation between the different spherical harmonic coefficients. So the expectation value of ALM and AL prime M prime is non-zero only if L is equal to L prime and M is equal to M prime. This prediction though can be modified by a variety of um, late time effects. So for example, gravitational lensing actually induces off diagonal correlations between different spherical harmonic coefficients. Um, inflationary physics beyond inflation, you know, um, Three-point functions, four-point functions can induce um, off-diagonal correlations between different spherical harmonic coefficients and other forms of exotica. So <clears throat> it turns out that the most general 
two-point correlation function for two different spherical harmonic coefficients can be parameterized in terms of things that we call bipolar spherical harmonics, these capital A's. And these capital A's, we, we have here is an expansion in terms of capital L's and capital M's, which are sort of total angular momentum, the total angular momentum for the sum of the LM and L prime M prime. And here these C's are Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. And so the most general cross-correlation between an ALM and a different AL prime M prime can be written in a, as an expansion in terms of these bipolar spherical harmonic coefficients as a sum over capital L's and all capital L's and capital M's. So what we pointed out in this paper is that these bipolar spherical harmonics can be decomposed into odd and even parodies. So if capital L plus little l plus little l prime is even, then that is an even parity bipolar spherical harmonic. If capital L plus little l plus l prime is odd, that is an odd parity bipolar spherical harmonic. So it turns out that gravitational lensing, um, various types of statistical isotropy violation, um, patchy reionization, um, variable cosmological parameters, so you know spatially varying cosmological parameters, all turn out to induce non-zero bipolar spherical harmonics, but all the bipolar spherical harmonics that those um, new physics ideas induce have even, um, only induce even parity bipolar spherical harmonics. Um, but as I said, bipolar spherical harmonics can have odd parity. And the odd even split is analogous to an EB decomposition for CMP polarization. So just like we can take a CMB polarization map and decompose them to E and B modes, we can take these bipolar spherical harmonics and decompose them into E and B modes. And what we actually showed is that you can, in fact, induce odd parity bipolar spherical harmonics um, by lensing um, of gravitational by gravitational waves, if you have chiral gravitational waves. Um, and it also turns out that you could induce odd parity bipolar spherical harmonics through various systematic effects. And so these things can also be used to look not only for new physics, but they can also be used to look for um, systematic artifacts in the data. Um, the other thing I should tell you is that there's a straightforward recipe for measuring the bipolar spherical harmonics. If I have been given a temperature map specified by spherical harmonic coefficients, little ALM, um, I simply sum ALM, ALM, L prime M prime over all L and all L prime M prime multiplied by these klebsch gordon coefficients. And that gives me this bipolar spherical harmonic. So there's a straightforward recipe for inferring them from data. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, uh, I told you this, so these even and odd parity bipolar spherical harmonics can be odd parity, sorry, parity breaking bipolar spherical harmonics, a combination of both even and odd parity bipolar spherical harmonics can be induced by lensing by chiral gravitational waves. Um, we showed that in the paper, although the signal is weak. Um, the other thing I want to tell you is that um, these bipolar spherical harmonics are effectively a parameterization of a four-point function. So um, if you look at my fingers over here, what I'm telling you is that um, these bipolar spherical harmonics um, parameterize correlations between two different Fourier modes. So suppose my thumb is one Fourier wave vector, and my this finger over here is another Fourier wave vector. Um, if I have statistical isotropy, there's no correlation between those two different Fourier modes. But if I have, um, you know, violations of statistical isotropy parameterized by these odd paired by these um, bipolar spherical harmonics, um, that means that there's going to be a cross correlation between two the, these these two different modes. And if there's a cross correlation between these two different modes, and there's also a cross correlation between these two different modes, then it's effectively a four point function. So these bipolar spherical harmonics can be thought of as, in some sense, a way to parameterize four point correlations. Okay. Put another way, a, a, a biposh bypass cross correlation, a biposh bypass two point correlation is essentially a four point correlation function. Um, you can also have three-point correlation functions. So um, suppose I have a temperature map and it is given in terms of its spherical harmonic coefficients. 
um, there is a three-point correlation that I can construct in a Fourier space that's called for spherical harmonic space, that is the bispectrum. Um, you probably heard about various inflationary models that can predict a non-zero three-point function. Those three-point functions all have L1 plus L2 plus L3 e even, but it is conceivable that you could have um, a bispectrum that has L1 plus L2 plus L3 equal odd. So it's allowed mathematically. You can measure this from data. And here's sort of a picture of what it would imply. So if I had a parity th breaking three-point correlation function, then um, the correlation um, of modes that have L1, L2, L3 that can make this triangle would be different than those that have L1, L2, L3 that make up this triangle. And again, chiral gravitational waves can induce such three-point um, correlations. Um, you can also look for parity breaking or analogs of cosmological, um, cosmological bioreferentials in neutrino physics. So suppose I had um, a term analogous to a Chern-Simons term um, in the neutrino sector. So if I have phi F, F dual type terms in the Lagrangian, it also suggests I would have terms that involve couplings of phi, that scalar field, to um, the parity odd parts of the, the parity odd neutrino bilinears. And so Shinichiro, Ando, Irina, Moshioyu, and I thought about this a couple of years back. And so it turns out that if you postulate such types of couplings of a quintessence-like scalar field to neutrinos, you can have MSW-like mixing effects even as the neutrinos propagate in a vacuum. And this gives rise to novel and possibly detectable effects in atmospheric neutrinos and ultra high energy neutrinos. And um, I'm not gonna summarize the results, but people have actually sought these. There's work by Shinichi Rando and his collaborators where they've actually sought these types of signatures in ultra high energy neutrino data. Now, we have cosmic microwave background measurements, which constitute um, measurements of the two-dimensional surface of last scatter, but we also have galaxy surveys, which measure the distribution of mass, mass in three spatial dimensions. So it turns out that you can take correlation functions or gal um, that you would construct from galaxy surveys and construct parity violating or parity breaking observables. So if I have a distribution of mass in the universe, I have a density field as a function of three spatial dimensions, rho as a function of x, and I can construct a two-point cross-correlation, two-point correlation function, autocorrelation function, rho of x, the expectation value of rho at some position x times the, the value of rho at some other position that's separated from it by some vector r. Now, typically we write this as a two-point correlation function c as a function of the magnitude of r, and we don't care about the orientation or direction of r, and that is a consequence of statistical isotropy. So if C is a function only of the distance between the two points, that is arises as a consequence of statistical isotropy. It also arises as a consequence of statistical homogeneity. So C is a function not only of the distance, only of the distance between the two points, but it's also independent of X. So when we write rho of x, rho of x plus r is equal to c of r, where r is just the magnitude of the, the, the distance between the two points, that is a consequence of the assumption of statistical isotropy and homogeneity, or in the language of particle or quantum field theory, the assumption that the physics that gives rise to this is translationally invariant and rotationally invariant. So what it means or implies is that if I measure C as a function of the vector R, the isocorrelation contours will all be spheres. And it also implies the isocorrelation contours will be not only spheres, but the spheres will be same, the same everywhere in space. But it is conceivable that there could be departures from statistical isotropy. So it could be that you know the fundamental physics that gives rise to these two-point correlation function prefer, um, you know, picks out a preferred direction. And so it's conceivable that isocorrelation contours could be elongated. 
And it's also conceivable that these isocorrelation iso correlation contours could be elongated or magnified um, differently in different points in the universe. So the most general two-point correlation function can be thought of as a bunch of um, possibly elongated, possibly magnified or demagnified two-point correlation functions um, in different points in the universe. So the mathematics that describes the elongation of isocorrelation contours is analogous to the mathematics of that describes CMB polarization. So the CMB polarization, we're talking about elongations in two dimensions. These have two degrees of freedom, which are, we can think of the elongation and the orientation angle or the plus and cross polarizations. Um, for isocorrelation contours in three degree in three dimensions, we have five degrees of freedom, which can be thought of as the elongation um, and the magnification, and then the orientation in three spatial dimensions. Or put another way, um, with the two degrees of freedom in the CMB polarization, the two degrees of freedom associated with a spherically or uh, um, symmetric trace-free tensor in two dimensions. And these are associated with the symmetric trace free tensor in five dimensions and uh, three dimensions. So those five degrees of freedom can be decomposed into five modes plus a sixth if we also consider the magnification. Um, and those can then de be decomposed into something that looks like a tra two transverse traceless components, H plus H cross, for example, like the space time metric distortion and gra for gravitational waves. Um, two vectorial modes in which the elongation occurs along directions um, 45 degrees with respect to the direction of the Fourier mode. And then there's also magnifications and um, elongations along the direction of the Fourier mode. So, um, so Dong Hui Zhang and I wrote a paper where we showed how you would actually measure all these things from a galaxy survey. And it's straightforward, analogous to um, bipolar spherical harmonics in three spatial dimensions, but actually easier. But the interesting thing is that if I have um, elongations that I can decompose into two transverse traceless components, H plus and H cross, or two um, vectorial components, X, Y, it is also possible to decompose those transverse traceless or those vectorial components into right and left circularly polarized modes by taking um, um, linear combinations of the plus and cross or X and Y polarizations um, with um, different phases. So there's actually a recipe that we provide in this paper for looking for parity breaking in the galaxy distribution. Okay, so here's what an H plus transverse would look like. It's not the very best picture, but the elongation um, is sort of rotating as we go in this direction. And likewise, here's a picture of uh, a circular polarization for a vectorial like. Again, there's an elongation that where the, the, the magnitude of the elongation stays the same, but it gets rotated around as you go in the direction of the Fourier mode. So again, you can imagine applying these algorithms to the distribution of molecules in a DNA atom, and you should get something that's non-zero. So in some sense, this is a recipe for looking um, for DNA molecule-like structures um, in the galaxy distribution. But again, these are effectively a parameterization of four-point functions. Um, so um, I should say, and I'm sure we will hear talks about, as you may have heard, um, two different groups, um, Zach Slepian and um, his collaborators and um, Oliver Philcox have found some evidence, um, either the three or the seven sigma level, for um, parity breaking in the four point function for galaxy surveys. So that's an interesting development, and I hope we we'll learn more about that. Um, given the time, I'm going to skip this. There are also vectorial cross correlations that you construct. Um, there are also total angular momentum waves that you can construct um, for galaxy surveys that allow you to look for um, parity breaking signatures in other ways. Um, and there are also, and I'll just 
flash this slide as the last slide. Um, there are also prospects for looking for E and B modes if you can detect astrometric shifts in the positions of astronomical sources from lensing of bigravitational waves. So I will stop there. Gravitational waves, cosmic microwave background, measurements, galaxy surveys. Um, anytime you can think of a something in, an observable in astrophysics or cosmology that points in some direction, you can look for parity breaking. And I think it's interesting to search for any such parity breaking in any way you can find. Thank you very much. And I look forward to talking to you all in the discussion sections and hearing your questions and talking about recent developments. Thanks.